All right, let's get started. Uh, tonight's guest speaker is Eric Defonso. Eric began his birding life 30 years ago this year in 1993 while a graduate student in atmospheric science at the University of California in Davis. For a decade, he simply enjoyed bird watching solo for its simple pleasures while working full time as a software engineer. Uh, but after moving to Colorado in 2005, Eric became an avid whisker and photographer. He began pursuing sound recording in 2010 and has since uploaded over 2,500 recordings of birds to online sound lab libraries like the Macaulay Library Cornell and xenocanto.org. Um, Eric began working in 2013 for the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies um, on the IMBCR project, Integrated Monitoring of Bird Conservation Regions. And in 2023, Eric will be a survey crew leader in Colorado for a third full field season. He writes a column on birding by ear for the Colorado Field Ornithologists Quarterly Journal. He's led field trips for the Colorado Field Ornithologists Annual Convention, currently serves on the Colorado Bird Records Committee, and has done conservation and guiding volunteer work in South America. Uh, please join me in welcoming Eric Defonso. So are we good? Everyone can hear me? This is my inaugural hybrid presentation with Zoom and a live audience. So I'm trying to juggle everyone's needs. But I think it's all working. Thank you all for coming out. I'm excited to be here. Uh, this is going to be uh, something of an encore presentation. I actually gave a presentation this basic presentation just a month ago down at the High Plains Snow Goose Festival in uh, Lamar. Uh, I geared it more toward uh, very beginning birders, people who are visiting uh, at a birding festival. So because I hold the Fort Collins group in such high esteem, I kind of amped it up a little bit. I had a little bit of extra media. Uh, I wanted to cater to a more sophisticated birding audience. But don't worry if you are considering yourself more of a beginning birder. There's still, I'm going to gear this to birders of all ranges and abilities. And I want to help everyone understand the snow goose and geese in general uh, from the very beginning. So no one will be uh, left behind. I entitled this The Snow Goose and Friends, the Winter Geese in Colorado. And I know we're just starting to come out of winter gradually, uh, but as we all know, it's been a long, arduous, cold winter, icy, um, more than in the past couple of years, has been certainly. But we can still see geese, um, and, uh, and even if some of the interesting geese that we'd like to see are, are leaving, we can be ready for next fall. The snow geese are certainly a big fixture down in, or more in eastern Colorado, and especially in southeastern Colorado, which is why I did gear the presentation more for that audience. But uh, we do get snow geese here, and I'm going to talk a lot about geese for the next 45 and 50 minutes. Just to give you an idea of what the snow goose scene can be like, um, I recorded this short sample of video down in um, at uh, Pruitt Reservoir, which is about one and a half or so, is that about right? Two hours from here. Uh, back in uh, Thanksgiving Day, uh, just this last, last year, 2022. It was audio, but it's okay. It's mostly wind blown. You get a sense of uh, this is just a small snippet of the panoramic view through my spotting scope of the scene uh, of snow geese. And uh, yeah, it's quite something. Um, it's quite the spectacle. And I, you know, made the trip all the way out there just to, to enjoy that. What reservoir did you say? That's it. It's a Pruitt. Pruitt Reservoir. It's a state wildlife area. Hours. It's almost to Sterling. It's about 20, 30 minutes. 
Lawrence Shire story, just off I-76. So this presentation will be about the snow goose and the Ross's goose. And I'm gonna explain from the very beginning for those of you who don't even know, what exactly is a goose? What makes a goose a goose? Um, I'm gonna talk about first in general, kind of all the geese that we know about here in Colorado, both the common and the rare, but I'm certainly gonna be focusing on the light or the white geese, which is the snow and the Rosses, the snow and the Rosses goose. So what is a goose? What is even the word goose? Goose is a funny word. We get the word goose from a ancient Proto-Indo-European language word, uh, Gans, which descended to us through the more Germanic languages, including German, um, and uh, comes to us through an Old English Goss. And it is the word from which uh, we have our more modern words of goose, geese, gander, and gosling. And these are also kind of funny words, especially gander. You probably heard the expression, what's good for the goose is also good for the gander. Gander is actually the old word for a male goose. And goose is the old word for a female goose. But it's goose that came over time to the more modern versions of English to actually come to mean both male and female goose. We still use the word gander, but not very often. I don't hear birders use the word gander terribly often, but it is there. Uh, and those are all part of that, that root of G-A-N and so on. Gosling, gosling is that little ling ending indicates a diminutive. Young. And we see that word, that little suffix in other words in English, like yearling and hatchling and fledgling. In German, I've been teaching myself German in the last uh, few months. They have an ending L E I N, lion. You may, have, if you've ever heard German, sometimes you might hear the word Fraulein, like a little lady. And it's the same root, and the connection between English and German is uh, reflected there. So why is it called, why are they called geese and not gooses? So I always wondered that. We have all sorts of other words in our English language that are kind of similar in that the plurals are not what you might expect. It's not one man and many mans, it's men. One foot, two feet, one tooth, three teeth, not tooths. And goose becomes geese, louse becomes lice, and mouse becomes mice. It's a strange construction. Well, it's because we have this thing. I didn't create a slide for this because I'm really going off on a tangent. Which is, if you know me, this is what I like to do. I love tangents. It's because there's this funny thing in linguistics called the I mutation. And it's a feature of, in many Germanic languages, including German and English, where the plural of a word, the vowel, the second letter, or, or, or diphthong or groups of letters, softens or changes tone when you go from the singular to the plural. In German, for example, the word for man is man, der man. The plural is mena, so the a ah becomes an e. Eh. And this is what happens in English. Old English had a plural for man, which was menace. Uh -huh. now, mm -hmm. And the menace got dropped over time from the transition from Old English to more modern English. And so instead of menace, it just became men. And a similar thing happened with foot and feet and tooth and teeth. In German, for example, hand is hand, die hand, and then it's der Hand is plural, their hands. Ah becomes a. Eh. And goose, uh, goss became gesser. And the, as 
sound got dropped and it just became geese. That's where it all came from. That's why goose are geese and louse is from mice. Now you're probably wondering, oh, before I go there, what about moose? Because we all know we've all played that game, right? You know, why is it not meese? It's actually one moose, many moose. And that's because moose is not a Proto Indo European language root word. That comes from a completely different language. It comes from a Native American language, an Algonquian language. Uh, and we get that word from there directly. And like one, you know, we have plurals for deer, one deer, many deer, one fish, many fish. We have one moose, many moose. We don't change it to these because it doesn't follow that Germanic root rule that we have. Anyway, I just think this is really cool. <laughs> and I think it's absolutely important if you're going to understand snow geese because you got to at least know where the word geese is. Yeah. So I'm glad you joined me on my little exploration there. So, what are geese though? They are in the order of birds called Anseriformes, the waterfowl. And you may not have known this, but the waterfowl are inclusive of pretty of a larger group than you might have thought. There are actually three families of birds under Anseriformes, and I've listed them here in taxonomic order. There's Anhibidae, called the screamers. Ever heard of a screamer? Well, you will now. Uh, there's the magpie goose. It's a monotypic family that uh, was recently constructed. Uh, the name, the Latinized name is Ansoranatidae. Then there's the group that we're all familiar with, the ducks, the geese, and the swans, and they're in the family Anatidae. Now, what's an example of a scream? There are three species of screamer in the world. They're all in South America. And these are more distant relatives of our familiar ducks, geese, and swans. Uh, this is the horned screamer, uh, so-called because you might see it has this keratinous extension off the top of its head. That's the horn. It's a pretty large bird. All the screamers are pretty large. And they all can fly, but they do walk around a lot. You can see they've got, whoops, they've got very large, powerful legs. The magpie goose, the other family, uh, is this very funky looking creature that used to be considered a member of the larger ducks, geese, and swans family, but it was broken out because it's just so strange. And I don't know much about the magpie goose. This is a bird of the Australasia region. So many, many miles from here, but it has that very peculiar head knob, and uh, it's just a strange duck. <laughs> but everything else is what we're more familiar with. And this isn't all of them, of course. This is just a screenshot of the Birds of the World online uh, listing of all the birds that are in anatomy. There are actually 179 species of ducks, geese, and swans worldwide. Quite a few. If you wanted to see sort of a breakout of what is, are the relations between all these disparate families, this is a nice family tree diagram. Uh, here's Anseriformes. And the families that I mentioned here, there's the screamers. This is actually a picture of the southern screamer. There's our magpie goose, Nimidi, and Serenatidae. And then all the birds that we're most familiar with, the ducks, geese, and swans, are in Natidae. These boxes indicate what are called subfamilies. Subfamilies have this name, this I N A E ending. And then underneath subfamilies are what they call tribes. There's not going to be a quiz, don't worry. <laughs> I, I can sense fear in the audience. But please know fear. This, I'm not expecting anybody to remember this. I just kind of want to give everyone a nice visual picture of broader waterfowl order and just, just get a sense of what the relations are between these very diverse but recognizable birds. The 
grouping that we're going to be concerning ourselves with is this tribe called Ansariti, which you may not be able to see too easily on the chart. And underneath Ansarini are these very large waterfowl. And these are the geese. And there are this, a couple of swans down at the bottom. There's a hooded merganser under the tribe of Merlini. And under the dabbling duck tribe Anatini, you can see the mallard and the shoveler. This funky thing, what do you think that is? This is an extinct creature. This is called a diatrima. Um, and you can actually see a specimen of the diatrima at the Sternberg Museum in Hayes, Kansas. I know this because I often drive on I-70 to Kansas City to visit relatives at least once a year. And I have sometimes stopped at the Sternberg Museum. It's a really nice museum. They have many great specimens there. And one of them that they have there is this diatrima, which is apparently determined to be an ancient relative of our ducks, geese, and swans. It's notable for its very large, menacing looking bill from which it was uh, formerly sort of probably currently called the terror bird. It was probably flightless, but it had these enormous, powerful thighs and legs. It was long thought to be a predatory bird, but I think the latest discussion in paleontological circles is that it was actually a vegetarian bird. Why it needed such an enormous beak, I don't know, but it was. Okay. That's pretty cool. So what are the other geese that we have in Colorado that we won't really be focusing on, but I want to at least mention because these are the friends of the snow geese. There are the white cheeked geese that we're most familiar with, both the Canada and the cackling goose. There's the greater white fronted goose, the Grant, and more recently, new additions to the Colorado state list the pink footed goose and the barnacle goose. And I will show some pictures. The Canada goose is certainly the most familiar, most common. Well, I don't know if it's the most common goose. It might be also the cat goose, but it's one of the most common ones. Very familiar. It's got the long, dark neck. It's got the broad, white cheek. Kind of a longish bill, big body, dark legs. The cackling goose used to be considered a subspecies of the Canada goose until it was broken out about 15 to 20 years ago. Also has a white cheek, but uh, photo by Andy Banker, by the way, former Fort Collins fixture friend of mine, uh, has a much shorter and more stubby triangular bill, a blockier head and a shorter neck, and a higher pitched honk. But very common now that we have broken them out and they're all, all the forms of the cackling goose are smaller than the uh, Canada geese. And we're coming to realize that there are quite a few in Colorado, especially here in the Front Range. You may have also encountered in your goose searches a greater white fronted goose. They often are found in very small numbers in flocks, large flocks of the white cheeked geese notable for their white front, but otherwise they do blend in well with the Canada's and the Catlins with their brown plumage. They do have orange legs. So if they do have their heads tucked and you see a huge flock of Canada and Catlin geese, look for the large waterfowl with bright orange legs standing amidst all the dark legged Canada geese. But also be aware that mallards have orange legs. The Brant is a very handsome, more coastal duck that occasionally shows up in Colorado. I don't know if anyone's had a Brant in the Front Range uh, this season. I haven't heard any reports, but um, they do show up uh, from time to time. Uh, they have no white cheek, but they do have this really lovely, delicate white frilling on the top of the neck. Uh, this is a black brand. There are different color wars I'm not going to really go into, but uh, just to give you an idea of what the brand looks like, they're a little smaller than the Canada goose. Uh, 
about the same size as the capillary that, that we cited earlier. This is one of the more recent additions from just 2019, uh, found by Steve Blumhoff. Uh, amazing sighting uh, amidst a large flock of candies. And this was actually not that far from here. This was down uh, near Longmont, uh, just east of Longmont. Uh, Pink-footed goose, first state record. And there's also the barnacle goose, which I think Steve Warnoff also found uh, just about a few weeks later. Um, first documented state record, has a very large white face, uh, also kind of smaller than most candies, but uh, easily overlooked if it angles in any way. Now this is a goose that has not ever occurred in Colorado, but I like to put it in here just because maybe someday. One will show up. Um, this is a much more coastal goose. And um, I don't know of any sightings. Well, there's, I know of only one occurrence of emperor goose that was anywhere close to Colorado. And that was 25 years ago. A dead emperor goose was found in Nebraska. Um, and, uh, but in central Nebraska, not really close to Colorado. And that is the closest report that I was able to come across like a paper. But it's a super handsome duck and if, or a goose. And if you did see one, I'm sure you would recognize this is not a normal goose. So let's get to the start of the show. This is no goose. We're going to introduce the goose. And by that, I mean, we're going to talk about its color morphs. We're going to talk about the plumages of the younger and the older birds. We're going to uh, discuss its range, its migration habits, or its migration patterns and its habitat, and also go over its usual diet and its nesting habits. So we're going to try to learn as much as we can about snowy and Alaska geese, but starting with the snowy Here it is. Very handsome goose, all white. This is the typical um, white morph snow goose. All white except for these black uh, uh, wing feathers, uh, flight feathers, the primaries. When they're folded, they're usually seen uh, in the rear of the bird. Bright orange bill and a curious looking, what's called a grin patch. And here's a big, another picture that kind of shows it a little bit better. You can see this interesting feature of the bill. It's like, it looks like it's, I've, I've seen it referred to sometimes as lipstick on the goose. It's more than just that. And this other picture kind of shows it really well. It's not just a coloration peculiarity of the bill, it's actually a feature of the geometry of the bill. So the upper and lower mandible have an edge, which is called a called a tomium. So there's an upper and a lower tomium. And this tomium on both sides is belled in a way to create sort of a, a two sharp edges to this bill, which it will use in a way that I will discuss shortly when we talk about its feeding habits. But it gives this bird a, a distinctive black mark that you can see at a distance uh, through a spy scope or binoculars and is distinctive to the snow goose. It has a kind of a pointy end to the bill, which I will also point out again later when we discuss the Ross's goose. But those are some features of the face of the snow goose. The snow goose also has bright pink legs that distinguishes it in, in its adult form. And that distinguishes it from some of the geese that we talked about before, like the uh, greater white flanger goose and the canada and cackling geese, which have uh, orange and dark so blackish legs, respectively. One thing about uh, both the snow and the Ross's geese that I'll, I'll mention at the same time, uh, the sexes cannot be distinguished visually. So males and females are pretty close to the same size. If there is an average size difference, you would not, you can't really tell in the field. The males and females are virtually identical. Now, one thing that makes the snow goose really special for us in Colorado and, 
and especially in the Midwest where the most common is that we get to see this darker morph. And this used to be called the blue goose. Um, and it still is, you can, you can call it the blue goose and you'll know what you're talking about. But uh, I guess technically we can just call this a dark morph snow goose. And it is, it has the same kind of head shape and green patch of the white morph, but you can see it has a much darker body. It's not quite black and it's not really blue, but it's uh, the blue is more like in the uh, leading edge and then the co coverts of the uh, wings, the upper and the underwing coverts. It has a, a long stretch of dark wing uh, feathers and it still has a white tail but it has this dark extending all the way up, uh, well, in the varying amount, as we'll see shortly, uh, along the neck. This bird doesn't really show it too well, but some birds will have some of this dark extending all the way to almost to the crown of the head, but only on the very back. Otherwise, the face will look very light. Here's another example of a bird standing so you can see uh, what the uh, lower part of the body is like. It this still shows some amount of white, but you can also see the white, really lovely white lining on the flight feathers. It's a mix of dark and light. So when the wings are folded, it has that really uh, lovely pattern to it. Maybe, I don't know if you can see too well on this image, the that dark stretch I was talking about. I was able to see this on my, I had it on my laptop, and it might not be showing up too well, but yes, sometimes that dark extends all the way up to the crown. And of course, you can see that very distinctive green patch, tonal bevel. Now, sometimes people see a hybrid snow and Canada goose that looks very much like this, the pure snow goose. And I certainly have been fooled by this a few times, but uh, I've been learning what some of the differences are, and I wanted to share some of the things you might look for. Now, I just picked one image to show here. There can be a lot of different forms of hybrids, and uh, but a lot of times what you'll see, and things that can tip you off to knowing that you're not actually seeing true snow goose, but rather a hybrid, is that if it's a hybrid snow in Canada, well, the bill is all dark here. Every image and every time I've ever seen a true blue goose, they have an orange bill with that green patch. This bird has a very white head and neck, albeit with the dark splotching, but that bill, that's a Canada bill. It's a Canada bill grafted onto a snow goose head. And I don't know if you can see too clearly here, but the body color is a little different. This is you know, getting close to being black, whereas the Canada goose body will be a dark brown. And this is more of a dark brown. Uh, in this case, you know, all that dark splotching on the neck, that is not something you'll you should ever really see on uh, like on a white background on a true uh, snow goose. Anyway, that's just one example of a hybrid goose, and but it does happen. And Eric. Oh yes. The back, the legs. Oh, what's that? Legs. Oh yes, and the legs. Thanks for uh, John just pointed out, and that, I, I meant to mention that. Also, note that the snow goose will not have dark legs. They will have darker legs when they're younger. I'll we'll get to that shortly. But an adult would not have that sort of dark gray to. I loved this picture and I wanted to include it because this shows three individual snow geese um, flying in, uh, right next to each other, but showing a little bit of the variation that can occur in the blue morph or the dark morph snow geese. So, and you can really see that when you look at the pattern on the neck. And this is just individual variation. Uh, like on this middle bird, you know, there are some dark feathers, but uh, you know, the, the border is a little diffuse there. Uh, on the birds in the front and back, you know, that line is much sharper and there's not much of a dark extension of the back of the neck to the top of the head. 
but you can really see quite well how that blue appearance in the uh, upper wing looks when the bird is in flight. And you can see a little bit of difference in the slight uh, coloring pigment on the tail feathers. And there could be a little bit of difference that this one is almost all dark as opposed to this one, which is much lighter. Again, this is all individual variation of scenarios, uh, but you can get a sense of the basic pattern. Then there are the young ones. And this is an immature bird, meaning that this is probably uh, in its first, well, it is in its first winter. Uh, geese generally undergo a, well, they undergo two molds. This is probably more information than we really care about. But strictly speaking, you'll see this like in the Sibley Guide, they refer to this as a juvenile plumage, and it technically is not a juvenile plumage. This is called a formative plumage. It's, you could call it an immature plumage, and that's, that would be correct. But this is like the juvenile plumage is molted out by the, the, the newly hatched birds in the first country two or three months. So by the time we start seeing the young birds here in Colorado in the late fall, like in November or December, they'll be molting more into a plumage like this, this formative. And you can see like that green patch there, but it's otherwise has a more grayish body. Has dark legs, not really pink yet. The bill is starting to be younger. Now this is a white morph immature. The dark morph or blue goose immature looks quite different. It's very dark and has blue or dark gray, bluish, all the way through the head and the bill. Now, I haven't mentioned anything about what is, these are all snow geese. What is that? Orange. Uh, when I talk about their feeding habits, I'll talk about feeding habits. I'll have a Here's an example of an adult and a juvenile or an immature swimming together. So you can kind of see side by side, they're about the same size. But this is the blue morph immature, and this is an adult, right? You can see that even on the blue morph, some of those white feathers are starting to come in. And that's what's creating that really peculiar speckled pattern. And you, can, might, you might be able to see that some of the pink is or orange is starting to come in on the bill as well. Here's a cool shot showing all four of the plumages that I've been discussing all in the same picture. There's the white adult and there's the white miniature on the far left. And in the middle, there's the blue morph adult and blue morph immature. So you can really see for And here's a nest of very newly hatched snow geese. These are probably no more than two or three days at the oldest. And I'll be discussing shortly the nature of this nest and the nest site here. Um, but you can kind of see some of the characteristics of this nest close up. These little gossips. So where do we find the snow geese? Um, this is a range map showing in orange where their breeding areas are. And as you can see, they're all up in the high Arctic. There's some along Hudson Bay, a little further south, but there's a lot of uh, their breeding area up in the uh, little islands in the Arctic Ocean and northern Greenland. So these are birds that retreat from our area in the spring and they go thousands of miles probably about two, at least 2,000 miles north of here. And they migrate through much of the uh, Great uh, Plains, the Northern Plains, and uh, winter in the Midwest, here in Colorado, and all the way down into uh, Northern Mexico. We're gonna focus on the area in Colorado that we're, that we live in, that we care about, and that's what we're down here. eBird now has these really great abundance and range maps that show you what movements are 
based on all the sightings that hopefully you were all diligently making uh, and submitting to eBird, they compile all those, all that data that you submit and do a little math and statistics on it and then plot it on a map and it produces this really fascinating thing that shows you as the months go by, week by week, what the snow goose population is doing. And I can play it here. And I want to focus just for a moment of that right now, because now we're in the middle of summer. You can see what it is with the snow geese are in the middle of summer. And then by like fall and into winter, they've return to their wintering areas and you can see large numbers in the, in the Mississippi Valley and also here in the Midwest. Now, I don't know if you can see this too well, but here's Colorado, the big square, and there's two little jutting out portions in the range map. This is the Arkansas Valley, this is where we have our high plains snow goose festival in the fall. And up here is the Platte, the South Platte. And I don't know if you can even see, it. this is pretty small, but where that, that little purple extension ends, there's a little bit of orange, and that's where we are here in the front range. Every now and then, we would get a snow goose or two or three or four or more. I think um, I remember hearing about a large group of snow geese up near like Rawhide or Douglas Reservoir a couple months ago, like 50 or 100, which I think is pretty unusual. I don't know if that got verified. Counting on the main I don't know. Double tag. He wasn't sure. But I remember hearing a little bit about this. That's very unusual. Most of the time, the snow geese that we find here in Colorado are going to be further east, like along the uh, Platte or you know, Arkansas. This winter, as we all know, it got very cold, especially in December and into January. And a lot of the water, of course, froze everywhere along the Platte. And most of it actually froze in the Arkansas Valley too. Uh, when I was down in Lamar, uh, there was really only one significant body of water nearby where the festival was that had any open water. And that's where we went to find the snow geese. The other places that we had gone in previous years, like the, uh, the Queens Reservoir areas were completely iced over. So this greatly limited where our field trips could go to look for the geese, but at least where the water was open, we could feed down tens of thousands of snow geese, and it was quite spectacular. So what do you snow geese eat? They like a wide variety of plant species and plant parts. And I'm gonna read a nice long laundry list of the kinds of things they eat, seeds, stems and leaves, and rhizome, stolons, and tubers, and roots of grasses, sedges, and rushes, and other aquatic plants, and grains, and young leafy stems of the agricultural crops, stems of horsetails, like the, the equisitum species, and a variety of berries. In the breeding season, they like to eat orbs and tundra shrubs, which is pretty much all that you can find when you go up to the high Arctic in June uh, and July, August. Now, that bill I was telling you about that has the beveled edges, that's what they use to bite through some of these things that can be pretty tough. And having that sharper edge and that little color pattern makes it easier for them to, uh, to do so. That's one of their adaptations. And remember, I also showed you the picture of the geese that have a lot of that orange coloring that looks like rust. Well, it is rust. It's iron oxides in the soil because the geese are plunging their heads in trying to dig out roots and getting all sorts of stuff on their faces. Uh, the roots that they can then bite through with that uh, tomial beveled edges that they have on their face. It's just the coloration and it washes off. Uh, young goslings will feed on fruits and flowers and shoots and horsetails and get their protein from midge larvae. So that's a big thing, as you can imagine, up in the high Arctic in the summer. I can't imagine um, insects up there. The nest, I don't know if you can see the picture here that shows this little lovely little mat. Um, the 
nest is selected by the female uh, who builds and well, selects and builds and maintains the nest. The male plays no part in the case of this mongoose. However, um, well, the nest itself is a scrape or depression lightly lined with down or vegetable matter. You can see there's a lot of like fluffy stuff and you can see it's kind of a nice little depression and a little grassy plume. And there's a little bit of like dead grass and things kind of banded around. The male does have play a role and he does stand guard over the nest. Um, it's still a pretty dicey situation up in the high Arctic in the permafrost in the tundra areas. And uh, they do try to protect it. The average size of a clutch is about three to five eggs. You can actually count four goslings in this nest, so it's a nice average situation in this particular nest. They only make one brood per season, and uh, that's it. If the nest fails early, they give up and uh, they will vacate the area. Some brood parasitism occurs. And there's also other types of goose hanky panky going on uh, a little too shortly. But brood parasitism, if you're not familiar with that term, refers to a phenomenon that also occurs with cowbirds and cuckoos, where a uh, bird will lay its eggs in the nest of another bird to be raised by that other bird. And this actually does occur to a small amount uh, among some geese. Uh, there's also some, a small but not ignorable percentage of the goslings. This was determined through a study. They actually examined this uh, in a detailed way that two and a half percent of the goslings in the study area were from extra pair copulations. That is not from they were not fathered by the male who was guarding the nest. So make of that what you will. But uh, the brood parasitism also is a phenomenon where a female will actually go about laying its eggs in another goose's nest. And that is, um, uh, they try to avoid that. The, 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 the pair that uh, occupies the nest will try to shoo away another goose that comes close. But interestingly, if that female goose is successful and deposits the egg, even while there's a fight going on, once the egg is in the nest, that female who owns the nest will uh, protect it and raise it. So once the egg is there, she inherits it. And that's the end of that. So uh, a given nest can actually have more than four or five eggs. It could have six or seven. And that female will actually try to raise all the young. So now let's explore the Ross's goose, the very close cousin of the snow goose. And as before, we're going to try to identify it, go over color morphs, uh, range, migration, and habitat, and diet and nest. The Ross's goose is a cute cousin. Of the snow goose. It has a much smaller build. It's about two thirds of the size of the snow goose on average. Uh, it has a different bill shape. I don't, I should have put a different slide up to compare so you can compare. The face of a snow goose has a more complex shape of the white border between that and the bill, whereas the Ross's goose has more of a straight vertical line. This gives the, snow, the Ross's goose a very gentle face expression, very soft. Uh, it has an orange or a kind of a pinkish orange bill, dark eye. But because the bill is smaller and it has a much more rounded head, it has that softer, more gentle facial expression. It has the dark wing feathers that uh, can show up behind it when it's uh, in like in this swimming motion. A lot of Ross's geese have a feature also that is unique to them that the snow geese don't have. And you can kind of see it. This is called a caruncle or caruculation or like a wart like protuberance on the edge of the bill. And uh, that actually.
actually is a little more common in the males than in the females, although I think the females do show it. And I think it also grows as the birds get a little bit older, so it becomes something of a status symbol among the Ross's geese. The bill tip, unlike the snow geese, snow goose is a more rounded. Snow goose has a more slightly more pointed tip. It's a subtle thing, and but you're only going to see it if it's a close up like in the spring. But that is the difference between them. And like the snow geese, they have bright pinkish legs. And you can see on this bird also that triangular bill, a very straight border between the face and the bill, and that little coracle. That soft expression that the Ross's goose has never really changes. So even if the bird is in a high stress situation, it looks really mellow. And I'm, I'm sure the bird is really freaking out right about now, but you wouldn't know it. The face of the bird, the bird just kind of has this look like, sorry, no, be right back. I just got to take care of this one thing. I'm about to get eaten alive, but no worries. So I, I think that's kind of an interesting situation. Now, like the snow geese, uh, Ross's goose also has a blue morph or a dark morph. And I kind of saved the discussion about what the deal is with these dark morphs and these light morphs until uh, I got to this part of the presentation. So the, what is the difference, you might wonder. Now, they used to be considered, like in the case of the snow geese, um, they used to be considered different species uh, up until about uh, 40 years ago when the, in the case of the snow goose, the blue and the white were then lumped. The only difference in the birds themselves between those who have the dark coloration and the, those who have the light one, there's one gene apparently, and it is a, what they call an incompletely dominant gene that expresses as this dark pigmentation that shows up in the body and on the wings. I am not a geneticist, so I don't fully understand what it means when they say it's an incompletely dominant expression. But um, what, how it shows up in these birds is that in the case of the snow geese, there are uh, about, I think it's single digit percentage of the population are these blue morphs. The vast majority are the white morphs. In the case of the Ross's goose, it's a much smaller percentage of the Ross's geese are these blue morphs. It's like maybe 1% or a fraction of a percent of them are these darker birds. Now that's kind of interesting, but it's the same kind of genetic thing. If there's this one gene that is either, if it's there, it at least mostly dominant but it is more dominant. So why aren't all the geese by this point, you know, if there is this dominant gene, uh, why is it only showing up uh, in these small percentages in the snow and even smaller for the losses? And this is where they've done a lot of recent uh, genetic detective work. So snow and losses geese were uh, kind of, they split off from each other probably about 2 million years ago. That's what the genetic evidence seems to suggest. And the, they did research on what is called the mitochondrial DNA. And they determined that the mixing of the blue morphs and the white morphs with each other really only started to take place in a significant way about a century ago. So only like maybe in the late 1800s, early 1900s, was there a, a, a beginning to mix not really hybridize, but to integrate between the blue and the uh, white morph snow goose. Now, there's not much evidence that the Ross is goose lineage had a blue morph until relatively recent. Um, and that's reflected in the fact that the percentage of Ross's geese that have, are blue morphs is very small. So, uh, 
the fact that these birds, uh, the snow and the Rosses, were connected for um, up until about two million years ago, and then started to diverge genetically after that. And then this color morph arose among the snow geese and has, through hybridization, managed to make its way into the Rosses geese. To me, that's also a very fascinating um, sub story of the snow and Rosses connection. So here's another photo of a Rosses goose blue morph. That this one also has that rust coloring on the face because it's plunging its head into the ground that's full of rust. I love that really delicate coloring on body patterns and photos. They do hybridize with other non white geese, uh, Rosses, and Canada. This is a photo from Rob Raker, who may be familiar to some of you. He's a birder down in uh, the Denver area. And we've got this really quick shot of um, a hybrid Rosses in Canada. It has a very soft, gentle, rounded head of a Rosses goose, but a much bulkier body of a Canada. I don't think I've ever come across a bird like that myself, but they do exist. Now, immatures are interesting. So the immature Ross's goose, kind of like the immature Canada, but except or immature snow goose, but it's not gray, it's mostly white, but it does have a lot of the young ones will have this uh, darkish feature on the face. Kind of and if they do not have the pink legs, but when they're young, they still have kind of a darkish, maybe even a darkish bill. This kind of illustrates the size of the Rosses. This is also an immature bird that you can see swimming with, uh, I believe those would have these. So it's about the same size, a little bit smaller, for the petite goose. And this also shows the diminutive size of the Rosses goose, because uh, even though the picture isn't in full focus, it's, you can see clearly that it is around some mallards. And it's about the same size as the mallards. So that's a useful trick if you're not sure if the white goose you're looking at is a snow or a rosses. If you're lucky enough and it's around some other ducks, if it's about the same size of the duck, it's a rosses goose. If it's substantially larger, it's less. I was not able to find a photo of an immature blue morph or dark morph rosses goose. The only image I could find was off my Sibley app on my phone. And so I just made a screenshot and put this up here. Um, so they, it kind of looks like an immature blue morph snow goose, but it's a bit smaller and it has you know, shorter extended range or longer range. I certainly have never seen one of these myself. Or those guys. So they're quite rare. Here's a range map of the Ross's goose, and you can probably remember that it's pretty similar looking to that of the snow goose. You know, breeding areas up in the high Arctic and maybe along Hudson Bay. They do breed in the same areas as like the snow geese and Canada geese, which is one reason that hybridization occurs. And they do winter in much the same areas, a uh, little more broadly distributed, although they are in they are in smaller numbers. One thing that's interesting is the Ross's goose is more common in the, on their Pacific flyway and in their Pacific um, coastal, not really coastal, but uh, more coastal state wintering areas in uh, central California. And there is a good place if you want to see lots of Ross's geese. And I wanted to just Juxtapose it so you can go back and forth and see the similarity in the ranges of the snow and losses. Um, just uh, as in the snow geese, there's a little area in southeastern Colorado where the snow goose festival is, and in sure enough, you can find Ross's geese fairly plentiful through the winter. There's also an uh, eBird abundance and range map showing the, how the losses goose moves about. 
And you'll notice that in the middle of the summer, some of the data just kind of vanishes altogether. I'm not sure exactly why that happens. Um, there, it's true that there aren't as many Ross disease, but surely they don't completely vanish in, uh, for a month uh, in June and July. I think it's just a lack of being able to uh, have any way to submit lists and things in those kind of habitats. Sure that again. But you remember, I pointed out like in Colorado, there's the Platte River Valley and the Arkansas Valley um, wintering birds. And uh, once we get back to late December, you can see that again, there's the Platte, North Platte, or South Platte, and there's the over Arkansas. And there was even a little bit in the front range. If you go use your eBird app and you find a Ross's goose, you'll notice that, I don't know if it's the case for Larimer, but uh, even through the winter, I think Ross's often flags is rare. I don't know if, I, I can't remember if that's through all the months, but uh, because Ross's is generally less common than the snow, even here in the front range in the winter. So what does the Ross's goose like to eat? Well, you might guess that it's something like the, the snow geese like to eat, and that's true, but there are a few exceptions. Um, like the snow geese, a wide variety of plant species and plant parts. Uh, they have a smaller bill, and so they're more adapted for grazing on short blades of grasses and sedges and things, and not really the taller things. And that's gonna, that plays a part later in my discussion about the populations and like where what is happening with uh, the birds on the winter. Uh, uh, their bill is not as effective at digging up roots and tubers, so you don't find uh, Ross's geese as often with uh, rusty coloration because they're, they're not trying to pull out the kind of things that are longer and, and thicker because they don't really have the bill to make good use of it. They will do it from time to time. In Southwest Louisiana, they tend to be restricted to rice prairies um, for where they like to eat, but they, and they are hardly ever found though in the coastal marshes because in the coastal marshes, they holler prickly plants. And again, their bills are not as adapted for feeding in those areas. They, they like to eat areas where it's shorter grasses. And apparently from what I understand, they are strictly vegetarian. Meaning that I don't think they even go after their insect diet, or at least they're not known to. I was not able to find a cute picture of Ross's goose nestlings, but I'm going to guess that they both very much like the snow geese. Uh, probably the bills are a little different, but this is cute. They're still cute. Not going to be much different. Uh, not much is really known for certain about their nesting habits because there haven't really been many studies on the Ross's goose, geese per se. But it is known that, like in the snow geese, that the female does select the nest site, but the male does assist in the case of the Ross's goose and helps guard the nest. Uh, the nest site itself is very similar. There's not a whole lot of difference in available construction materials when you're in the permafrost, so it's almost always going to consist of at least some mossy material and some down feathers mixed in. Clutch sizes, two to six eggs, an average of four. And like the snow geese, there's only one brood per season, so it has to work. Uh, kind of like the movie that I showed earlier, this is just a still shot showing just the sheer magnitude and numbers of snow geese that can show up in their preferred wintering or in their migration corridors. Um, tens of thousands, 30,000, 50,000, 100,000 geese can be in one single spot. And it is really a remarkable thing to see. This is at a place called Loose Bluffs in National Wildlife Refuge along the uh, Missouri River, uh, just a bit north of Kansas City. So to summarize, there's our bird with the rusty coloration of the snow geese. So these are birds, the snow and the rosses that breed in high Arctic areas. And uh, they winter much further south, and southern and western and coastal US and up in northern Mexico, uh, both species. Their populations. So 
the latest estimates that I've seen for the uh, uh, total number of snow geese in North America is about 16 million compared to about 2 million for the Ross geese. And this is really interesting because about 70 or 80 years ago, the total world population of snow geese was estimated to be less than a million. But, uh, uh, and that was due to habitat degradation and to uh, significant uh, hunting pressure. And so measures were taken to uh, uh, protect the wintering grounds and to uh, also reduce hunting pressure uh, on both the snow geese and the Rossies. I can't remember what the numbers for Rossies were at, at that time. It may not have been known. But the snow geese have rebounded significantly, uh, and especially in the last 30 or 40 years, their populations are now estimated to be increasing at an annual rate of 5%. And I don't know if you know much about the statistics, but a 5% growth rate is huge for an annual rate. That is a very big number. Um, like if you have a bank account that grows at a 5% rate every year and you don't touch it, after a decade, you know, quite a bit more money. And after two decades and three decades, you're going to be really making good money. And that's how it is with the snow goose population. Um, they have rebounded in a very big way. And um, so much so that uh, in the last 10, 20 years, um, the powers that be have decided that they need to actually reverse some of that uh, protection that they put on the studies because what's happening is that uh, the large numbers of wintering snow geese are now starting to degrade some of their wintering habitats uh, because of the excessive amount of um, grass and, and the ground level plant uh, consumption that they're doing. And even with the changes, though, that they have of um, um, uh, reducing or eliminating hunting bag limits and increasing hunting hours and extending the hunting season on snow geese, uh, and having that result in a doubling of the uh, annual harvest of snow geese, the population is still growing. Um, and now the concern is that possibly in the next decade or two, uh, the snow geese might really start uh, adversely affecting the habitat on their breeding grounds up in the high Arctic. When you have that many breeding birds, now it's not to say that all 16 million snow geese are actively breeding, but certainly a large percentage of them are, um, enough so that that growth is putting a lot of that pressure. So it's kind of an interesting story with the snow geese is that they're they have benefited greatly, and uh, their numbers are reflecting of that. And that's usually good news. That's a good story. But um, the pendulum might be swinging a lot the other way. Like I mentioned, populations have been increasing. Uh, again, good news, and but some concerning news as well. Both species have similar nesting and eating habits, but they have there's some exceptions based on their size and the morphology, but they're otherwise kind of similar. Uh, they migrate together and they breed together, um, although they do uh, segregate when they're on the same uh, breeding grounds. The snow geese are kind of in large and in charge, and um, the Ross geese are a little bit, they don't get the choice nesting sites. Um, but the Ross geese are themselves doing reasonably well. I want to thank you all for coming and. Uh, I hope you'll get a chance to behold the spectacle of these lovely and numerous white geese in migration. Uh, and you'll have a chance to see and hear scenes like this, like the mass liftoffs like uh, we got to experience um, in uh, the Snow Goose Festival or on your journeys out east to eastern Colorado, or if you get out to the Central Plains or Missouri River Valley. Thank you. Okay, sure. So, uh, yeah, we have some time for questions, and I will there be questions from the Zoom? Yeah.
Yes. Yeah, I'm curious about um, the food source during winter. I know what the hay you're going to catch is that not winter wheat, mm -hmm. and also possibly the Apache they plant the winter wheat. Do they do that here? Oh, like in Colorado. So the question was uh, uh, we know that, uh, like in South Texas and places like that, they plant winter wheat. Uh, and they do that in places in the more southern part of the winter. Do they do that in Colorado as well? That's correct. Yeah. So I don't, it depends. I mean, some of the growers uh, down, like in the Arkansas Valley, uh, they may plant things, but there's a lot of fallow fields, so fallow corn, milo, and things like that. And what I got to see when I was uh, leading trips, just perusing the areas where the snow bees were, is that they're getting into those fields with the uh, stubble, like the corn stubble. Uh, weed stubble and milo and things like that. Um, I, I'm not sure much about what the planting, uh, how common it is for winter wheat, say, to, in Colorado. I'm sure there is some. Um, but uh, yeah, the snow geese are certainly finding whatever fields that they like, and a lot of them are these, you know, at least currently uh, dormant fields anyway, and they're finding plenty to feed on. Um, to, you see a field with 10,000 geese and they're just rummaging away. So that seems to be uh, what's more common, at least in this part of their range. Mm -hmm. oh. um, yes, oh, first. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is a good question, but the geese and um, people are big like obviously, but um, there's crossover sometimes. So my question is, are these these potentially being affected by COVID? By COVID, um, I have no idea. Certainly, the big news story in the recent months has been the avian influenza. Mm -hmm. And that has definitely been affecting yeah. all the waterfowl. Oh, the, I'm sorry, the question was, were they being affected by COVID? It's only really affected by viruses. Um, and like I mentioned, the avian influenza has been a big story. When I went up to Pruitt in November and saw the large flock um, at the reservoir, I also did see a number of dead geese lining like the ice, the border of the ice and the water and along the uh, reservoir shoreline. Uh, I don't have a number offhand, but it was dozens, dozens of dead geese and other waterfowl along. And there was also um, a number of bald eagles, adults and juveniles that you know, feeding on carcasses and hunting some of those birds probably. We have an article in our March newsletter about avian influenza. Okay, there's an article uh, in the uh, Four Cause of Run March newsletter about avian influenza. So that's maybe a bit pertinent. I don't think there's, from what I understand, there's not really crossover of that strain of avian influenza to humans. I think there is. We don't know. Maybe there is. There could be some. There's some evidence. Yeah, it's not conclusive yet. So. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's a dire threat, but uh, it can happen. So, so you had a question? Um, this is really good here. Uh, black antelope. Just recently read something that they are more used as a flight stick feather and are more resistant to wear mm -hmm. than white. Is that any truth to that? Yes, so that's an interesting thing. Now, the, the white of the, oh, so the question was um, about the black wingtips of the snow and the Ross's geese. And, and, and other oh, birds. Are and other birds, yes. A lot of birds will have dark flight feathers. Um, so pigment, like, and black is, I think, created by melanin. Uh, pig, that pigment serves as a strong reinforcing mechanism to the feather, to the to the feather, to the uh, to the veins. 
uh, and the barks and the feathers. Uh, it makes them more resistant to wear, which is one reason why you don't see a lot of species of birds. There are some, but not many, that have white wing feathers because the wings get used a lot and they will wear out pretty quickly. The body feathers, white wing body feathers can wear out more easily. But flight feathers that are dark can last longer because they're just stronger. And uh, that is seems to be a positive adaptation for birds like geese, especially that fly so much. Um, the white that you see on these birds is comes comes from a recessive trait in, in the gene that determines how much where the pigment goes. So um, you know the fact that the darker plumed birds like the dark moors uh, are that way because of a more dominant gene means that it's more helpful to the bird if they have the gene to have those dark feathers, but that, that gene has not propagated through much of the population. But all the forms of the geese do have dark white feathers, and that does strengthen them, makes them more resistant, for sure. Oh, yes. Um, the uh, plant feathers that you have this kind of migration happens, so in the eastern Colorado, oh, in eastern Colorado, I my experience is that they tend to come through, they start coming through in October, later later in October. I mean, you'll start seeing a few uh, white geese perhaps earlier in the fall, but it's not really until November that you start seeing the more substantial numbers, um, late October into November. Now in the Platte, North, or the South Platte uh, region, um, they will stay up there at least a little while longer until those Lakes and reservoirs start to freeze up completely. Um, I was there, like I say, around Thanksgiving, and there's still plenty of open water. Things are starting to ice over, but it's a big reservoir, so there's a lot of space for them. But those birds will start to make their way to southern Colorado and will stay there uh, for the rest of the winter, but they'll, they'll really start arriving in big numbers in, I'll say, like early December or so. Uh, and they'll stay there through about now. They actually probably start to leave in February around the time of the Snow Goose Festival, but uh, they're still fairly plentiful. Um, they take a while to make their way all the way up north. And this is kind of an interesting side note to that migration, which is uh, all that effort to uh, improve their wintering areas and also to improve the areas where they uh, make staging stops on their migration with uh, by making agricultural fields more available for their feeding has probably played a huge part in those population increases. Um, and I don't know if you remember, you, love, you saw that um, abundance and range map movie. Uh, you could see that uh, their path up to the far north was kind of slow and methodical was because they're stopping many places along the way as they make their way up to the breeding areas. So even though they leave here in March, they don't arrive until June up there because they're stopping along the way, mostly in Canada, but you know they're, they're finding stuff to eat now that their um, uh, ancestors, or I should say, yeah, their um, you know, the birds of the 20th century did not have available to them. And this is playing a big part in how they migrate and probably when they migrate. Whole bunch of thanks for the great presentation. Oh, awesome. thank you. Uh, yeah, so thanks for the close ups of the bills and everything for ID purposes. Mm -hmm. And uh, just knowing that uh, I saw a bunch of Boske in. Uh, oh, yes. Yes, Boske is a great place. So the comment was yeah, people mentioned that there's lots of snow geese. And a number of other places, including like in New Mexico and Muscat Del Apache. Excellent place, not just for cranes, but for snow geese. Okay, John. Eric, you said a little about the bill structure in the Rosses, but mm -hmm. um, how, is, is the grin patch um, diagnostic between these species? Um, yeah, the extent of it is. So the question is is the grin patch uh, difference? Is that truly diagnostic between Rosses and snow geese? With the snow geese, I would say yes. Um, you should never see a Ross's goose that has an extensive 
like a large green patch. I, I don't know if I can back up enough. Well, let's, here's our snow goose, and you can see that it has a very broad feature there. Yeah. The snow goose, or the Ross's goose, um, let's take a good shot here. So like this bird, it does have a little bit of dark along that um, uh, the tomium, you know, the, the edge of the bill, but it's not nearly like, looks like it's grinning or anything. It's just a, a line. If, you, if we got to see a picture of the bird really close up, we could see it. it also has a little bit of the bellowing that the snow goose has, but it's much reduced. And that's partly because the bill itself is just a lot smaller in size. But I would say that that's a pretty good feature. One thing I did not show, uh, and I thought about this a lot, is there are pictures of hybrids between uh, snow and Ross's goose. But I, I decided not to show because it's, I make things plenty confusing <laughs> by showing you so many different plumages and, and hybrids. And I just, uh, that'll be a snow goose, you know, 201. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's actually something I'm still uh, trying to understand myself. But, uh, but yeah, when you see some of those hybrid pictures, that's where it gets really tricky. It's like, well, that bill looks almost like halfway between. And, uh, it gets tough. Thankfully, it's not a super common thing, but it does happen. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a puzzle to be figured out for sure. <clears throat> Maybe one more question. I've got an announcement to make, so please don't run off just yet. Um, All right. Okay. Well, thank you again so much.